لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله. Talking about the topic of the khutbah, I wanted to address here today. I wanted us to be able to take this opportunity for us to be able to reflect upon something truly beneficial. I was in fact reading through a text with some of the students and it was talking about the most serious illness that any human being can be afflicted with is ghafla. It's what is translated as heedlessness. But that translation is a translation a lot of times many people can't relate to. Because you translate an Arabic word into a, such a difficult or obscure English word, people don't connect with the concept. I want you to imagine like you're trying to, you're flicking, uh, the, you're turning the switch of a lamp. You keep turning the lamp on and off, on and off, on and off, but it won't turn on. And you keep flicking the switch over and over again, but it's not turning on. So what you then do instinctually is you follow the cable. So you see, where does the power source come from? And you follow the cable all the way back and you come to the end of the plug and you see that it's lying on the ground and it's not plugged into the socket. It is cut off from the source of power. And that is why the lamp will not turn on. That is the mental image I want you to have of ghafla. That is ghafla when you are disconnected from the source. And the source for us of all spirituality, of all good, of all khayr is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So when a human being becomes disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the very essence of ghafla. And that is where all problems arise from. That's why that is the most serious illness and everything else you see manifest within a human being from all the specific diagnoses that we might have spiritually. Those are all the symptoms or the manifestations or the outcomes of this illness of ghafla. And when the scholars talked about how do you remedy? How do you remedy this ghafla? How do you repair this ghafla? And they talked about the different steps to remedying the illness of ghafla. The very first thing that they identified is reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to go back to the book of Allah, you have to connect to the Qur'an, you have to read the Qur'an, understand the Qur'an, reflect upon the Qur'an, and it unlocks the heart. And this is exactly why when Allah presents a challenge, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran, That do not people reflect deeply upon the Qur'an? قفالها, and that's why Allah talked about their hearts being sealed up in locks that were designed for those hearts, because distance from the Qur'an is like a lock being placed on the heart, which obviously means the only way to break free of that lock and that, that, that constriction upon the heart is to go back and access the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what I wanted us to reflect on here today. The second thing before I even talk about what we're going to reflect on is that this, this philosophy is there from the very beginning. Even the revelation of the Quran, if you observe it, the word tanzil is used. Tanzil is a slow, gradual, progressive revelation. And the reason for this methodology, this is the educational philosophy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ realized this and demonstrated how this is to be implemented, and that is quality over quantity. And abundance was never preached, and abundance was never emphasized, but it was emphasizing and, uh, and, and implementing quality over quantity. So keeping these two things in mind, we need to use this opportunity, this blessed opportunity of Friday, to reconnect with the Book of Allah. And number two, implementing that philosophy of quality over quantity, I just wanted to talk about one ayah of the Qur'an today, and that too is an ayah that is about the size of a line. One line, one ayah from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today. It is surah number 42, surah to shura, ayah number 20. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man kana yuridu harth al-akhirah, nazid lahu fi harthi. This is the first part of the ayah. And I, I'd like to kind of break this down so we understand it intimately, personally. The first and foremost thing Allah says is man. Man in the Arabic language, it means anyone who. It is not restricted by any means. It is a general word that applies to any intelligent being, any human being. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening this up, men and women, young and old, regardless of where you're Arab or non-Arab, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, who you are, what's been going on in your life, Allah is pre presenting a qualifier. Whoever you may be, wherever you may be coming from, whatever your background is, kana yuridu. Kana yuridu. The word kana in the Arabic language, when paired with this present tense verb, yufidu istimrar. Somebody who consistently, consistently did what? Yuridu. Yuridu comes from the word irada, which means to intend something. To aim for something. Allah is not saying whoever achieved. Because achievement is not in our hands. We are not questioned about the results of things. We are questioned about our intentions and our efforts. So Allah is not saying whoever achieved, whoever accomplished, no, 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 no. Whosoever consistently their goal, their aim, their priority, their objective was what? Harth al-Akhirah. Harth in the Arabic language refers to harvest. Harvesting the crop, like a farmer does. Whosoever con continuously, constantly, kept their priority, their primary objective as the harvest of the life of the hereafter, Allah says, what will happen to that person? Nazid lahu fi harthihi. Allah says, we will continue to increase. We will increase in the harvest of that person. And this is a concept we should be familiar with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةً فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا Whoever brings a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that person a tenfold of the reward of that deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the analogy, and again, this is not a coincidence. This is the beauty and the consistency of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah gives the example of farming. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ حَبَّةٍ the example of those who spend in the path of Allah is like the example of a seed, a singular seed. When you plant that seed into the ground, what happens? Seven different branches come sprouting up from one seed. And each of those branches has a hundred more seeds. So one equals 700. Allah is giving that example to demonstrate that one singular deed could be multiplied 700 times by Allah. Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha. And of course Allah multiplies, continues to multiply for whomsoever He wills, however much He wills. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if somebody keeps their primary objective being the harvest, the life, the benefit, the outcome, the reward of the life of the hereafter, Allah says we will increase in that person harvest. We will give them more than what they worked for. We'll give them more than what they deserve. We'll give them more than what they've earned. We'll multiply the reward so many fold you can't even comprehend or imagine. But there is a flip side to this coin. Because if I can pause here, see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being in this predicament. Right? لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Allah created this human being in this predicament. The predicament is this, we as human beings were created for a dual existence. We have two lives lying ahead of us. We have our temporary existence, life in the life of this world, and we have an eternal life of the hereafter awaiting us. And the human being was placed into this world with interest, desires, right, temptations. Objectives, ambitions, goals. <coughs> and now this human being is constantly in this paradox of what do I choose? What do I prefer? The life of this world or the eternal life of the hereafter? So Allah is presenting a perspective through a very real life scenario for us that whosoever constantly maintained the fact that their primary objective, their priority was the harvest the benefit of the hereafter? Allah says, we will increase in that person's harvest. But on the flip side, وَمَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا نُؤْتِهِ مِنْهَا But whosoever, whoever it may be again, doesn't matter where they're coming from, what's been going on with them, but if they constantly maintain the fact that their priority, their primary objective was the harvest and the benefit of the life of this world. A dunya, the life of this world. Allah says, نُؤْتِهِ minha. We will give that person minha. The word min, يُفِيدُ tab'id. 
لمعنى تبعيد من means a portion or a part of something we will give him or her a small portion or a small part of it now what does that mean a small part of it right because ultimately what we understand is that no matter how much a person desires nobody ever owns the entire world but let me also kind of explain to you what this means to us as human beings from a real world perspective what this means see perspective is everything right they say perception is reality and so based on your perspective the world is according to how you perceive it but let's take a look at how we perceive the world think of the wealthiest person you've ever personally known like not something you've read about or something you saw on television or in a movie no no think of the wealthiest person you have ever met or interacted with or seen or witnessed let's just say for example the person is worth 10 million dollars and they own three homes and five cars and a boat right this is the wealth of this person when you look at that person up close you feel as if this person owns everything he's got the world at his fingertips right this guy owns everything he's got everything that's how we talk about it but let's take a step back zoom out a little bit to gain some as we say the big picture this person owns three homes 10 million dollars five cars based on all the money and all the homes and all the cars in the entire city of Dallas what percentage does this person own? Not even a real percentage, not even a comprehensible fraction. Fraction. It's not even a real fraction that this person owns. Then you zoom further out, compared to all the money and all the homes and all the wealth and all the cars in the entire state of Texas, what does this person possess or own? Again, you can't even put it into numbers. It's so minute, so insignificant. And then you zoom out further to the entire country, the entire continent, the entire world, and then understand that we are only at one point in time in the history of this world. So compared to everything that is called dunya, everything Allah has created from the beginning of time that He will put into existence till the end of times, what percentage of this dunya does this person own? Nothing. He's not even a blip on the radar. And Allah says, minha. But this person wanted the entire world. This person wanted so much more. Allah is saying we will only give that person a very, very tiny, small fraction of things. But the real catch is this. But there will absolutely and Allah negates this with the ma, refuting the idea that contrary to what you might have been told, what you might assume, what you might even delude yourself with, this person has absolutely no share, no stake, no, nothing waiting for this person in the life of the hereafter. This person has nothing to their name. Nasib is like, you know, have you ever seen like when something has your name on it? Something is reserved for you. This person has nothing reserved for them, nothing with their name to it, waiting for them in the life of the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents this clarity and this idea and this thought. That this is the choice that you stand between. Investing and making the life of this world and the temporary benefits of this world your priority versus the eternal benefit and the life and the reward of the life of the hereafter. Now, while this is powerful in and of itself, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, but we're not done with this. See, we have to learn to study a little bit further and dig a little deeper and understand. One very pertinent and relevant question I was asked, and I had the same question, was why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the example of farming here? Harf, harvest. Why did Allah use the example of farming? Because see, what we say, so somebody could answer that question right off the bat and say, well, the example of farming is used, used here. Why? Because at the time the Qur'an was revealed, many people were farmers, and so that's why Allah used the example of farming. There's a problem with that thought process though. The problem with that thought process is that what we believe, not just what we say, what we believe is that the Qur'an was revealed for all people all throughout the world, throughout time. The Qur'an is eternal guidance. 
So if the Quran is eternal guidance, it is just as relevant today to the IT worker in Dallas in 2014 as it was to the farmer 1400 years ago in the desert. The Quran is just as relevant and just as applicable. So the question is, why did Allah use the example of farming? And when I asked the, the, the teachers and the mashayikh and read the tafasir, what I found was something really, really profound. They said, because you see, Allah is making us reflect on the experience of the farmer. Because the farmer possesses a couple of qualities that are very unique to his preoccupation, to that job. Number one, and again, I don't have any experience farming, so when you go and you ask farmers as well, they tell you this, that this is true. Number one is that a far farming requires patience more than any other type of work. More than any other type of work. There's no such thing as a quick turnover. There's no such thing as flipping something very quickly or turning over a quick profit or uh, minimizing your profit margin for a more quicker turnover. None of those ideas exist in farming. Farming is you put that seed in the ground, you turn the soil, put the seed into the ground, cultivate it, take care of it, and then sit on your hands and wait for it. And the family of a farmer will tell you that in the months leading up to the harvest, the family of a farmer lives off of what they sold the previous year. When that, and not only that, but they, if somebody is a potato farmer, his family eats a lot of potatoes. You eat from your harvest and you sell your harvest and that's how you live. In the months leading up to the harvest, the money starts to run out. Then in the weeks leading up to the harvest, the stock of crop that you have from last year also starts to run out. In the days leading up to the harvest, the bills are stacking up, you're borrowing money from people, and you're scraping the bottom of the barrels. It's a very dire situation. But the farmer is patient. He can't walk up to the harvest, to the crop, to the fields and say, Yalla, I have bills to pay. Let's go. It doesn't work that way. But he just has to wait and wait and wait. And then his patience is rewarded in the form of the harvest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the example of a farmer here because if we will be people that will live in this world with all the needs and necessities and circumstances that this world comes with, but we will keep the akhirah, the life of the hereafter, as our primary objective and motive, we will have to learn to be patient. That I will sacrifice something today for something much greater tomorrow. And I will have to learn to be patient. The one who works for the hereafter is like a farmer, cultivating that crop, waiting to harvest that crop on the day of judgment in the life of the hereafter. And I will have to learn to be patient. Number two, the second very unique quality of a farmer based, compared to other occupations, is that a farmer has to have, he has to have trust. A farmer has to put his faith in something. He just has to put his, you know, have some type of faith. We call it Iman, we call it Tawakkul. We call it putting our trust and reliance and depending upon Allah. But a farmer has to have some type of faith or reliance or trust. Because you see, imagine that you sell diamonds. Imagine that you sell laptops or cell phones or something else valuable. When you leave your shop in the evening, what do you do? You take your merchandise, you go in the back room that has a lock and a code on it. You go into that back room and there's a safe inside of that back room. And you take your valuables, your merchandise, you put it inside of the safe. Then you lock and secure the safe that only you can open. Then you come out of that back room and then you lock and secure that back room that only you have the code to. Then you come out into your shop and you lock the door of your shop and you put the alarm code on and then you pull the shutter down and then you put a padlock on the shutter. That is how you secure your valuables, your merchandise, because you're a businessman. What does a farmer do when a farmer goes to sleep at night? Where does he learn, leave his goods, his investment, his merchandise? He leaves it out in the open. What would it take? It would take one person to come by and throw one match and it'd be wiped out in a number of minutes. In a matter of minutes, it'd be wiped out. It could start raining and then not stop raining and flood everything overnight. Somebody could come and just run through the fields with a truck and destroy all the crop in the harvest. Just think about the sheer possibilities of things that could go wrong. But that farmer has to find the faith and the trust to go into his home and lie down and sleep the night before the harvest. 
where he's eight hours away from what he waited eight months for. But he has to have that much faith where he says, Tawakkaltu ala Allah, I have put my faith and trust in Allah, Allah, you take care of this, and he goes to sleep. Look at that faith and that trust that farmer has. The believer has to be like the farmer. I have to put my faith and my trust in Allah. Allah will take care of me. Imagine, you know, you go to work, you're, today's the day of Friday, you go back to your office, you go back to work, a contract hits your desk, it's the last thing you have to do for the weekend. This weekend you'd like to take your family out, you'd like to take them somewhere nice, you'd like to buy your kids something nice, you'd like to go eat in a fancy restaurant. Right, so you're sitting at that desk and you look at this contract and it's worth millions of dollars and you realize that if you add a small little number here or a small little number there or you do a little bit of incorrect math over here, you could easily just get another extra thousand dollars that is not justified, that is not yours. You could slip it out of this deal. The deal is in the millions. This guy is so wealthy, he wouldn't even notice, not even a drop in the bucket for him. And I could get an extra thousand bucks. It's nothing for him. It's a big deal for me. I could show my family a good time this weekend. They've earned it. I've earned it, we deserve it. And you have a thousand dollars sitting on the table, they're looking out at you, calling your name. But then right before you do that, you think to yourself, no, this is wrong. I could take this thousand dollars right now, but I'm gonna have to pay for it many, many fold in the life of the hereafter. I am not willing to damage what I have built with Allah for the sake of a thousand dollars. So you pull your hand back, you put your pen down and you say, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna leave this thousand bucks that was staring at me. I'm gonna leave it here on the table and I'm not gonna take it because it's wrong. And then you go home and you find out that your air conditioning is not working. And you call the repairman, it takes a hundred bucks just to come out and look at it. So that's a hundred bucks in the hole. And he says, yes, absolutely. I can fix it for you today, because how are you going to survive in this heat without air conditioning? I can fix it to you for today, but it'll cost you $900. And you're sitting there looking at this bill, and the bill's for $1,000, what you just left on that desk. But now you have to be the farmer. You have to put your faith and your trust in Allah and say, Ya Allah, I have just made a thousand dollar investment into the life of the hereafter. And I know that you will not leave me hanging. I know you will not hang me out to dry. You will not abandon me, Ya Rab. And you will take care of me and I will not lose in this deal. Be the farmer. Lastly and finally, about this, I'll present one idea, one question. Somebody could say, brother, why is it gotta be one? Why are you making it sound like it's one or the other? Why, why is it gotta be one or the other? Why can't I have my cake and eat it too? Right? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us a dua? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Good here and good there. Why can't I have win both places? Absolutely. That's what we pray for. And that's what we work for. And that's what we hope for. But Allah is addressing a reality in this ayah. He's saying that there will be times, there will be situations, there will be circumstances where you will have to choose one over the other. A situation, a decision, you will face a decision where you have to give priority to one or the other. I'll give you one very practical, tangible action item for right now. Everybody is here for Jumu'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from everyone and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward everyone for being here. All of us. However, when we leave here after Jumu'ah, in about three hours, we will face a decision. It's called Salat al-Asr. You'll want to finish up work, wrap things up, beat the traffic home, run some errands, grab some groceries on the way home. There will be these decisions. And on the other hand, I will have stopping and dropping everything and taking care of my Salat al-Asr before I continue anything else. And that will be a prioritization that I will have to make. What will I give priority to? And when that decision faces me, I need to remember to be like the farmer and to invest into my hereafter, to be patient and to put my faith and trust in Allah and know that Allah will not disappoint me, Allah will not abandon me, and this is what's best for me. Let me harvest the reward of the life of the hereafter and Allah will make this world a place of peace and tranquility. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا When you work, this is the beauty of our deen. When you will work and prioritize the life of the hereafter, Allah will give you a life in this world, a beautiful life, a good life that will be the envy of others. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to all invest into our hereafter. Barakallahu lana wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Azim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim astaghfirullaha li wa lakum wa li sa'iri al-Muslimin fastaghfiruh innahu huwa al-Ghafurur Rahim.